It's Jackie's latest story, and Jackie, I want to have you take us through this. Talk of Martial Law Insurrection Act draws notice of the January 6th committee. I'm going to read some of it for our viewers. Under your byline um, and your colleagues, Josh Dossie and Tom Hamburger, uh, just a few minutes ago, The Washington Post has broken this story. Three days before Joe Biden's inauguration, Marjorie Taylor Greene texted White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. She told him that some Republican members of Congress believe the only path for Donald Trump to change the outcome of the 2020 election and stay in power was for him to declare martial law. The text from Green revealed this week brought to the fore the chorus of Republicans who were publicly and privately advocating for Trump to use the military and defense apparatus of the U.S. government to strong arm his way past an electoral defeat. Now discussions involving the Trump White House about using emergency powers have become an important but little known part of the House January 6th committee's investigation into the 2021 attack on the Capitol. Tell us more. Yeah, Nicole. So basically, in light of the Marjorie Taylor Greene text that came out this week, um, where she misspelled martial law, uh, her, her own martial pl her own take on the martial plan, um, <laughs> we uh, decided to really look at months worth of records, requests, court filings, and text messages that have been released showing the committee's deep interest in the all of the ways these fringe figures and established figures, elected officials, were trying to advocate for the president to invoke his extraordinary powers to strong arm his way into overturning his electoral defeat. Uh, in the court filings released just last Friday, something that didn't get enough attention was a proposal that we had previously reported on uh, by Phil Waldron, but hadn't actually seen in its totality, and it's pretty extraordinary. It was sent directly via email to Mark Meadows, who was viewed as a conduit by members and these fringe figures like Sidney Powell, Waldron, Patrick Byrne, um, to get these things in front of the president, the former president. And uh, Waldron himself was trying to uh, leverage these conspiracy theories to allow there to be an investigation into foreign interference using the Treasury Department, um, the uh, Office of National Intelligence, um, and, and again, all of the uh, different arms of the federal government to then create a rationale to seizing these voting machines. Um, it's a, a bit more complicated than some of the other schemes, less covered to overturn the results of the elections, but just is dangerous and the committee's task is going to be figuring out just how far these proposals got. We know that the former president did entertain some of these people in the Oval Office and expressed an openness and at times even agreed with some of these people about these plans, but did he ever actually consider them in, in all seriousness and did he line up um, any of these players that he had installed in really important positions in the last month of his government to actually execute uh, some of, of these, again, very concerning and, and dangerous plans. Um, there's an incredible quote from um, Judge Michael Ludig um, that says, Trump's invocation of these emergency powers would have been unprecedented in all of American history. It's hard to say it any more powerfully or chillingly than that. Yeah, Jack. Nicole, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, and Michael Ludig is someone who we might potentially hear from come June. Um, he was someone who was advising former Vice President Pence during this time on constitutional matters, was weighing in and, uh, you know, conveying that he did not believe that John Eastman's plans or any of the legal plans, quite frankly, um, were viable in any way to stop Joe Biden's um, electoral victory and overturn the results of the election. Uh, and, you know, he again, very. We should clearly state he's a Republican, um, and we could potentially hear from him in the the coming months. Um, lay out all of these different legal theories and and splice through them about why they were not viable and and just and give give some context on how dangerous they were. Yeah, I mean, Tim Miller, it's an, it's an important point, and what what Judge Ludig, I think. Uh, the prism through which I, I think people should think of him is in normal times, he's a, a conservative judge with unimpeachable credibility. What he says goes, like E.F. Hutton, when he talks, people listen. In the wild, wild lunacy that was the Trump White House, and, and actually, Jackie makes a great point, and only if you've looked at the text will you catch what she said about the Marshall Plan. This is what Marjorie Taylor Greene texted White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. The story just broke, so we didn't have a chance to build it. But it says, Marjorie Taylor Greene texts Mark Meadows this on January 17th. 
uh, obviously 11 days after the insurrection. In our private chat with only members, several are saying the only way to save our republic is for Trump to call for martial, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L law. She thought martial law was named after Marshall, I guess, and spells it that way. Um, another piece of, of reporting that is a, another brick in, in this wall of sort of extrajudicial and constitutional conduct under deep consideration at the highest levels of the Trump White House, Tim. Yeah, and I just want to, on, on Judge Liddick, on the, on, on the point here, I just want to drive home this point of just how conservative this, this man is. I, you know, he was, um, uh, he was with Scalia. He was clerk for Scalia when he was at the Supreme Court. This is not a moderate, you know, never Trumper like, you know, one of our friends, like Nicole uh, <laughs> uh, Liddick, in fact, in my opinion, didn't go far enough. Uh, if you look at, I've been, I've been reading. Uh, the Jonathan Martin Alex Burns book um, that all these re revelations come from. And Luddick actually was one that gave Mitch McConnell the cover to not impeach, to not convict Trump, uh, because he was the one that came up with this legal theory that you sh that you can't convict a president that's already out of office. So if they stalled long enough, they couldn't convict him. So in some ways, Ludwig was running cover for Trump, kind of with that legal theory and providing some some cover for McConnell, really to to do a polit to to make a political decision that benefited McConnell. So so this is a guy that you know is on you know the Trump wing of the Republican Party, a very conservative judge. If he is out there s talking about that, this is uh, an unprecedented danger to the republic uh, that needs to be taken very very seriously um because I, you know that means everybody to the middle everyone concerned about democracy in a bipartisan sense um, obviously you know should be extremely alarmed by that as well and just really quick on the cheney question that you had to eugene um also in in the martin book uh, the, the, the best friend of of kevin mccarthy jeff miller uh, is quoted in that book after they um, run Cheney out um, as saying at a restaurant in D.C., F that B. Okay? I can't say any of those words on TV. But, but I, I just I wanted to highlight that to just get, give you a sense for what Cheney is dealing with. She was saying all of the exact same things that Kevin McCarthy and Steve Scalise are saying on this tape and Mitch McConnell are saying. The only thing different that she did was stick with it when it became politically inconvenient. All the rest of them decided that the politics is more important than the five people that died at the Capitol, the, the existential threat to our republic. Uh, all of them decided their careers were more important to that. And so they were bit embittered and mad. And you can see that when you see them lash out at her in, in a personal way like Jeff Miller did in that book. And, and, you know, I, I just, I, they shouldn't be allowed to get away with that. And, and when we, you know, publicize what is happening, this is why what's happening in those private conversations between January 6th and the 17th or whatever are, are important, because they revealed that they all knew what Liz Cheney was doing is the right thing to do. And now they're all lashing out at her and punishing her and covering their tracks and lying about it uh, because it's not politically convenient any longer. Well, let me just add one more thing. To that. Well, first of all, you, you said something important about the real victims, and I, I want to always bring it back to this. This is Michael Fanon reacting to what he heard on the McCarthy tapes. The Kevin McCarthy's and Mitch McConnell's of the world, uh, I don't think they care about individual Americans. They care about their political careers. They've repressed uh, any, you know, ability to, um, I don't know, experience real like human emotion um, and that's unfortunate I mean the other thing of note though in that conversation uh, Kevin McCarthy was speaking with Steve Scalise yeah, I would have liked to have seen Steve Scalise speak out a whole hell of a lot more after uh, January 6th being that uh, you know like myself he's also a victim of political violence um, and you know again uh, GOP leadership position, and we just didn't see that. Tim, your reaction? And said it better than I could. Um, and as an actual victim, I, I think that it's important that he's listened to. And I think that, that you know, remember, these. That this is how just despicable these people are, that, that the McCarthy's of the world, they now are, are running cover for the, the, the types of people that called you know, Officer Fanon, a crisis actor. That's what they were doing on the other network. That's what the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world were doing. And, and, and all of these people that were insulting and mocking uh, the officers who were there to protect them and, and who were injured, you know, some of them obviously have, have, have later taken their own lives. 
um, uh, the, those people are being degraded and insulted by, by fellow members of their caucus. And, and, you know, a few weeks after all of that happened, the people who are supposed to be leaders, the guy that wants to be the Speaker of the House, Kevin McCarthy, um, uh, decided that, that, what they, that those folks are okay, that he, that he will apologize for them and welcome them with open arms into their caucus. But Liz Cheney is the one that needs to be expelled.